my guest. Fuzz Rana has joined us a number of times before on the air. He's the Vice President of Research and Apologetics at Reasons to Believe, author of several groundbreaking books, including Who is Adam, Creating Life in the Lab, and The Cell's Design. He holds a Ph.D. in chemistry with an emphasis in biochemistry from Ohio University. Uh, Fuzz, as always, great to have you on the line of fire. Uh, Michael, thanks for having me. Always a joy. All right. Uh, what is happening this Friday? Uh, why is Darwin in the news again? Well, uh, Friday would be uh, Darwin's birthday, and so uh, it's become commonplace now uh, every year on Darwin's birthday for universities around the country, in fact, around the world, to celebrate Darwin Day and to uh, herald the achievements of Charles Darwin and to advocate uh, for uh, acceptance of biological evolution. All right, so Darwin, even though he died so many years ago, even though so much scientific research from his day has now been considered completely outdated and outmoded, yet Darwin's theory still holds sway in a massive way uh, academically. Why is that? Yeah, well, um, it's more so philosophical than scientific, uh, Michael, uh, Mm -hmm. because the, the prevailing philosophical framework for science is called methodological naturalism, and that's a $25 term, but it just simply means that when you engage in science, you have to pretend as if God doesn't exist, regardless of your religious or philosophical beliefs. And so in a sense, it's um, imposing kind of an atheistic approach onto the scientific enterprise. Now, generally, that approach is inconsequential when you're doing work in a laboratory setting, but when it comes to question of questions of origins, that philosophical system forces you into a framework where certain theories of origins are permissible and other theories are impermissible. And so uh, if you embrace methodological naturalism, you have to evoke uh, mechanistic explanations for the origin of life and the history of life. And so even if there are challenges to let's say, Darwin's theory of evolution, and there, or, or there's evidence that points to the role of a creator in bringing life into existence, you cannot abandon the evolutionary framework because philosophically there's no other place to go. You're forced into that, that framework regardless of what the data says. All right. There is a, a booklet that is being made available for free this week on Reasons to Believe, that is Reasons.org. Folks, if you go to Reasons.org and just click on the mic, you will get a free copy of what Darwin didn't know. And this offer holds through February 19th. So go to Reasons.org. You'll see a mic icon. Click on that, and you can get a free copy of the booklet, What Darwin Didn't Know. So let's step back then. Uh, what what did Darwin have to work with when he wrote uh, Origin of Species, and, and how does his own personal background tie in with this larger narrative? Yeah, yeah, well, you know, in a sense, almost everything we know about modern biology was discovered uh, since Darwin's time. And so everything that we take for granted when it comes to biology were ideas that were simply unknown to Darwin uh, for the most part. In fact, Darwin's view of the cell was that uh, was a, what's called the protoplasmic view, where the cell was simply viewed as being a boundary, and then inside that boundary would have been uh, basically a jelly-like substance called a protoplasm. So Darwin had no concept of the sheer complexity of life at a, at a molecular level. In Darwin's day, there was very real, little known about the history of life on Earth. Uh, people had just begun to... Uh, really collect and analyze fossils. And so in Darwin's day, there was really an incomplete understanding of the fossil record, which is really critical in establishing the credibility of Darwin's idea. And of course, he had no understanding of DNA or the mechanism of inheritance. And so uh, in a sense, Darwin really had very little understanding of how biology really worked and very little understanding truly about the history of life on Earth when he had advanced his, his ideas. And, you know, um, Darwin's contribution, and it's a real contribution, is he demonstrated that species are not fixed entities and that they are malleable and they can uh, uh, vary in response to a changing environment. 
and Darwin suggested that this could even be a way in which one species gives rise to closely related sister species. In other words, he discovered a microevolution, which I think nobody really disputes, re regardless of their religious or philosophical perspective. But what Darwin then did is took that mechanism, mm -hmm. and he basically argued that that mechanism could explain the entire history of life. It could explain the design of, of biology or, or biological systems. And he, 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 by extrapolating that mechanism, he began to make essentially a metaphysical claim that namely God isn't needed for life, you know, origin or history. It could ultimately be explained through mechanism alone. And, and that really kind of fit uh, Darwin's theological perspective. Uh, Darwin uh, became deeply distraught when his daughter, Anne, died. The problem of evil became a very real personal issue that he struggled with. And mm. in, his, in his mind, he could not square the, the, the problem of evil uh, with the notion that there's a loving God. And in a sense, you could look at Darwin's theory as being a way in which he tried to resolve the problem of evil by saying God doesn't exist, nature is just simply the way it is because of this mechanism uh, that he discovered of natural selection, and uh, and so bad things happen to people, but it's just simply because of the vagaries of, of nature itself. Yeah, it's so fascinating. So Darwin, Darwin dies in 1882, born in 1809, dies in 1882, and obviously a ton of scientific information, data, was uh, was unknown to him at that time, and the more that we know, the the more we question whether Darwin would have come to the same conclusions. But it's really fascinating. I've met people who are intellectual atheists. In other words, they will give you their intellectual reasons for saying that there cannot be a god, or there or the god of of the Bible cannot exist, or whatever their specific thesis is. They're anti-theist. But when you dig down deeper, even though their objections are intellectual in nature, you go back to a trauma in their life where they were praying or believing God was going to do something and it didn't happen, and it seemed that the emotional, spiritual trauma played into things, often it's very difficult to separate those things in someone's life, isn't it? That, that sure is. You know, and you know, when it comes to you know, this whole idea of Darwin's theory of evolution, the conversation can become a very complex conversation, scientifically speaking. But at the end of the day, you know, uh, the, 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 I guess the, the, the point I'm trying to make is that it's ultimately a, a philosophical discussion, and the problem of evil fits very much in the, in the center of that discussion. It, it, did so, so, uh, uh, it did for Darwin, sorry. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And then, of course, it doesn't take away the pain of the loss, but now you don't have the spiritual pain built in and that that contradiction. And obviously the answer is found in God himself. If you eliminate him from your thinking, then your whole worldview shifts. All right, we'll, we'll have to start this here and then continue on the other side of the break. But in your view, what are the two most significant facts that if Darwin had known might have greatly impacted his theory? Uh, I would say in, in a nutshell, it would be the complexity of the cell and it would be the nature of uh, the history of life on Earth based on the fossil record. All right, so let's, let's expand on it. Take about a, a minute to expand on the first one, the complexity of the cell. And I know there's a ton to say on that, but we'll just get started here. Yeah, well, uh, again, Darwin's view of the cell was uh, the, the idea that it was just a blob of jelly. Well, it turns out that the cell is an unbelievably complex system, and that complexity is mind-boggling to the point that it's hard to envision how mechanism alone could account for uh, the complexity of the cell. Because it's not just simply complex, there's an elegance and a sophistication, there's an ingenuity to the way that the cell is structured at a molecular level uh, that, in my mind, revitalizes uh, the, the watchmaker argument for God's existence uh, advanced by William Paley. Right, so that you, you cannot, to this, to this day, well, let me ask you rather than say it, you're a scientist, you're, you're a PhD, to this day, have any naturalistic scientists put forth a credible explanation for the cell? No. In a nutshell, no. I mean, there's a <laughs> lot of ideas that are uh, being bantered around, but all of those ideas have intractable problems. And when you kind of tease, tease uh, the, the problems out, 
uh, you wind up seeing, uh, ironically, evidence that points to the necessity of an intelligent agent to bring uh, life into existence, to, to explain the cell. All right, friends, go to reasons.org, click on the mic icon, and you'll get a free copy of what Darwin didn't know, sent to you as a gift from Reasons to Believe. It's a free booklet. I think it'll really help you reading it, clearly written, and uh, hey, for all ages, get the information out. My guest, Dr. Fuzz Rama, Vice President of Research and Apologetics at Reasons to Believe, holds a PhD in chemistry with an emphasis in biochemistry from Ohio University. If you go to reasons.org, that's the Reasons to Believe website, reasons.org, click on the mic icon, they'll send you a free copy of the booklet, What Darwin Didn't Know, that's uh, uh, effective through February 19th. Uh, So, Fuzz, uh, right before the break, I asked you the question, what are significant discoveries that if Darwin knew, again, he died in 1882, if he knew them, might have greatly influenced his, his work. You said uh, one of them was the cell itself, the complexity of the cell, which does not yield to a naturalistic evolutionary theory. You gave a second. We didn't have time to get into it. So why don't you repeat that and then open that up for us? Sure thing. I think the, the second thing uh, would be the, the nature of the fossil record, which is a proxy for the history of life on Earth. And it's interesting because... When Darwin wrote Origins of Species, he had a chapter devoted to uh, problems with his theory. And one of the problems that he noted was that what was known in his day about the fossil record was incompatible with with his theory. Because Mm. the fossil fossil record didn't show gradual evolutionary transformation, but rather it showed biological groups showing up suddenly in the fossil record and remaining unchanged and then disappearing. And in fact, there was an event that uh, in Darwin's day was was noted in the fossil record called the Cambrian Explosion, where Mm -hmm. you have in these rock layers uh, that date now, we know, at about 540 million years in age, an explosive appearance of animals, complex animals. And this is their first appearance on Earth. And then in uh, lower rock, rock layers, which in lower rock layers, which would correspond to uh, uh, earlier ages, there was nothing in there showing any kind of evolutionary history leading up to the emergence of these animals. And um, Darwin argued, well, the fossil record is incomplete, and in that if you know we spend more time characterizing geological formations and discovering fossils, these these troubling features are going to evaporate and support will come from the fossil record for my theory. But the fact of the matter is, we've been, you know, characterizing the fossil record now for 170 years since Darwin's uh, uh, advanced his his book, Origins of Species, and the fossil record looks today exactly like it looked in Darwin's time. Organisms appear suddenly, they remain unchanged, they disappear, and the Cambrian explosion is as real a conundrum for evolutionary biology today, as it was for Darwin. And so, uh, in a sense, the concerns that Darwin had about his theory have not evaporated, but actually have been reinforced by 170 years of work in geology and paleontology. All right, so based on the fact that he, as a scientist, noted problems with his theory, this is obviously purely your opinion, but if he were alive today with the data that we have, what do you think his views would be? You know, it, this is really, again, a, a, a difficult question to answer. <laughs> you know, um, but in a sense, you know, uh, as, as I mentioned earlier, Darwin's motivation for advancing his theory was as much theological as it was scientific. And, and he did very good work in advancing his special theory of evolution, which we would call microevolution today. I think he, along with Alfred Russell Wallace, provided an explanation for uh, how species can originate from pre-existing species, again, through this uh, mechanism that we would refer to as, as microevolutionary transformation today. And his maneuver to extrapolate the theory uh, is not necessarily unreasonable, scientifically speaking. Could that mechanism explain large-scale biological changes? But Darwin really didn't present uh, evidence in favor of his theory. 
but rather, as Ernst Mayer, the famous evolutionary biologist from Harvard, said, he just presented one long argument for why he thought his mechani- his, the mechanisms he discovered could be extrapolated to explain the history of life. And so it wasn't really science at that point. It was essentially uh, a rhetorical presentation of the case for evolution. And it was largely, again, motivated by the problem of evil. And that becomes very apparent, you know, when you look at the letters that he writes to his friends. Uh, one of them, um, Joseph Hooker, where he makes the statement, you know, what a book a devil's chaplain might write on the clumsy, clumsy, wasteful, horribly cruel designs that you see in biology. So Darwin saw features in nature as, in his mind, being incompatible with a loving creator, and you couple that with the loss of his daughter. And again, it was really philosophy and theology and, and personal tragedy that, that drove his, his theory. Fascinating. Absolutely fascinating. We, we've just got two minutes left. I don't know if you can get into this, but there is an experiment that's still in textbooks. Uh, you can give me the correct pronunciation, the miller you re experiment? Okay. Yes. Uh, why is that still in textbooks, and why shouldn't it be there? Yeah, well, this is an experiment that probably everybody is familiar with if you've had high school biology. It's the experiment where Stanley Miller assembles this glass apparatus that simulates the conditions of the early Earth and right. produces amino acids. Well, mm-hmm. it turns out that, that the conditions that Miller used in that experiment uh, are not the conditions that would have existed on the early Earth. And, and in fact, if you use those conditions, you actually don't get amino acids, you get nothing happening. Uh, and, and, and in a sense, uh, original life researchers today recognize that that experiment is irrelevant to the original life question, uh, yet it does show up in biology textbooks. And, uh, and I think it's rather unfortunate. And the reason it does persist in textbooks, giving the false impression that there's a stronger case scientifically for the origin of life than there actually is, is because of its historical significance. It was the first experiment in origin of life research. It kind of inaugurated the discipline uh, as uh, an official research discipline, uh, and that's why it remains in textbooks. But I think it's unfortunate that there's not at least a footnote saying that Mm. nobody thinks this experiment is uh, is relevant anymore. Right. Yeah. Old, old myths die hard when, when they have a politically connect, correct narrative, don't they? So if, if folks get a copy of this booklet, what Darwin didn't know, uh, how will it help them? Well, uh, the booklet is essentially uh, a counterfactual analysis asking the question, if Darwin knew uh, then what we know today about biology, would he have advanced his theory of evolution? And we kind of stepped through different ideas that Darwin had about biology and how those ideas fed into the, his theory of evolution and what we've discovered since then and how those discoveries actually undermine his case for, for evolution. It's a rather small booklet. It's easy to consume in, in a single setting, and it's written at a, a lay accessible level. And, and so it's just simply giving people a tool to begin to have conversations about why it's scientifically credible to be suspicious or skeptical of the evolutionary paradigm. Mm. Excellent. So again, folks, go to reasons.org. That's the website for Reasons to Believe. You can do this the next week. Click on the microphone icon, and you'll get a free copy of the booklet, What Darwin Didn't Know, and explore the website. It's one of the most user-friendly, rich websites you can find. Fuzrana, thanks for being with us. Always a joy. Thanks for having me, Michael. God bless you.